talk about Zucker rats um, and some metabolomic data from a high performance instrument. Look at um, a piece of software that does some very interesting and capable analyses. <clears throat> talk about GC high res and its capabilities and then talk about GCGC TOF. Um, I will not have high res data here, but we'll talk about GCGC TOF of rats and breath. Objectives, um, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Talk about accurate mass and isotopic abundance and how it can be leveraged. Talk about chemical ionization and the unknowns again. How we can leverage deconvolution and how GC by GC can provide uh, additional analytes speak to the um, large number of unknowns again and how that plays out and then look at differential analysis in a couple of examples. This should look familiar, so I won't belabor it for those of you who were here, but just emphasizes the need for GC and LC and uh, my colleague from SIAX who speaks next. We'll cover some aspects of this as well, uh, Fatty, but they clearly provide complementary coverage. Why GCMS? This is one of the slides that's a repeat as well. Uh, it's fast and easy, um, good linear response. It's been around for 50 years, and um, as I alluded to last night, it's, it's seen a dramatic increase of re in the recent decade. Um, actually pulled up the numbers, and it's about a uh, eight-fold increase in publications uh, over the last 15 years. System we're gonna look at, Zucker rats. So everybody likes to study rats, right? Being politically correct though, we have a fit rat and we have a husky rat. He's not fat, he has emotions and we don't want to hurt his feelings. However, we're happy to take his liver, his serum, his plasma, etc. <coughs> this study involves three phenotypes, uh, lean, fatty, and obese. It's a balanced study with 12 animals in each. These are commercially available samples. We don't actually do our own studies with rats at, at LECO. Uh, we do it with collaborators or purchase samples. Uh, they were seven to nine weeks old, and the, uh, it was a terminal bleed. Sample prep, okay, there were three slides. This is the third slide that's replicated from last night. Uh, plasma, precipitated a protein with methanol, vortexed, centrifuged, dried, dried a second time, derivatized, and then analyzed on the Pegasus high resolution system. Why accurate mass? Uh, normally, you're going to have 2 to 5 ppm mass accuracy. 1 ppm dramatically reduces your number of hits, making life just a little bit easier and helping you have confidence in your identifications. To leverage that, we've got a, a unique workflow, um, only because we have gene data in our own software where samples are prepped, analyzed using EI and CI, and then by leveraging our software uh, and its deconvolution, along with gene data, its alignment, normalization, and statistical packages. Uh, we're able to identify metabolites and identify differentially regulated or differentially expressed metabolites. Uh, the details of our system are here. Again, this is from last night. Uh, details of ionization. We use uh, a 5% ammonia and methane cocktail for um, metabolomic studies. Provides a very soft compromise between the two ionization gases, giving you a very robust molecular ion, <coughs> excuse me, consistent with ammonia, but a little more efficiency in ionization consistent with methane. So uh, an interesting combination that we use routinely. So general findings. Uh, it's always good to see chromatograms, at least for those of us that are analytical scientists, and it shows uh, actually very little difference between them. Uh, it's kind of disappointing in some respects, but it also tells the story that the details are buried often in big features as well as congested space. And what we found in general was uh, total average number of features at a single to noise greater than 100, and that's an important qualification, of 660. I call them features because as uh, Chris Peter alluded to, some of it's just rubbish and some of it's truly metabolites. If we qualify this further and look for ID matches, so things that are, are, are well qualified with a database, uh, we average 274. And if we go a little different here and go for a weaker match, 600 out, out of 1,000, 
In a 2 ppm mass match for the molecular ion, we have 266 features, and this is out of 36 total samples. So it's some pretty good numbers to work with and some pretty high confidence for these last two in particular. <clears throat> um, deconvolution proves very useful in a number of cases, and this is just one example, where here we have three analytes that co-alluded, um, or partially co-alluded, and would normally be attributed to a single peak, but they're actually very important because uh, methionine, not modulated in this particular case, 5-oxoproline, or pyroglutamate, is modulated, and methyl decanoate is an internal standard. So if this was identified as a single peak, you'd have problems. You'd have a modulated analyte that was hidden, and you'd have an internal standard that was hidden, both uh, creating issues. Um, EI, so to give you an idea of what the spectral capabilities are, um, this is, is 5-oxoproline, uh, 0.77 ppm mass accuracy for this particular one, and then if you look deeper, um, library matches for, sorry, I can't, uh, for decanoid, I believe, methyl ester, again, 1 ppm. Uh, we have a long laundry list, but here's representative, uh, negative mass errors as well as positive. A little bit of bias in this case suggesting the calibration may have been off slightly, but in general an average of 0.9 parts per million. So very robust performance and consistent results. What do we do with this data? Uh, 36 samples, a few thousand total uh, data points to look at. We put this into Gene Data Expressionist. Uh, it's something that we've worked with Gene Data on uh, to do data processing, and it does pretty much everything you'd want it to do, from alignment to normalization to statistical processing, identification, um, and so on. I won't belabor it because uh, it's a presentation in and of itself, but it, it's been truly optimized to handle high-resolution data, uh, and it does provide cross-correlation, as Fatty will talk about next. So what did we see? Well, if we put these constraints, uh, looking for fold changes of 1.5, plus or minus 50%, and p-values of 0.05, relatively robust criteria, we had more than 65 analytes that met that criterion and can pretty readily, uh, and somewhere I lost my 3D space on this, I don't know why, uh, but you can pretty readily distinguish the populations with those criteria. There is one issue with, with a lot of metabolomics data that we didn't talk about last night, and that's library redundancies, okay? A lot of biological compounds go by two, five, 20 different names, and they're in the library that way. Makes triaging the data a little bit difficult and time consuming, but uh, we'll get there, right? What pathways were implicated by all these metabolites that were changed? Um, a lot of them. Uh, amino acids, carbohydrates, uh, fatty acids and fatty acid precursors, um, members of, of the glycolysis pathway and, and uh, citric acid cycle, uh, specifically branch chain amino acids, which feed into the fatty acid metabolism. And again, these are fatty rats, and thus the name Zucker fatty rats. A couple of specific examples, because it's always nice to see how things modulate and, and what specific analytes do. Uh, serotonin, which is associated with obesity, sleep, and appetite, as you can see, is downregulated a little bit in fatty and obese, and as compared to lean, uh, this representing the average of everything. Branched chain amino acids, I mentioned isoleucine, uh, and we always see more variability in the fatty and obese than the lean. Um, here it's shown as upregulated in fatty and obese. And I, I assume that's because of the control of the metabolism and, and time points for those animals. And then finally, uh, as an example, again, myo-inositol. And this is the pathway it's involved in for um, uh, inositol lipids. As you can see, we used two different ions here, and this is, is an indicator of the importance of, of accurate mass. Two different ions um, to track myo-inositol, 217.107 and 318, uh, both selective, but as you can see, the error associated with the 318, much, much tighter. It's a more selective ion with a better signal stability, potentially due to less interference, um, 
but not due to abundance, because as you can see, the 217 is more abundant. Uh, but clearly, um, both provide the same effective uh, relative changes and uh, provide a confirmation that in fact this analyte is modulated with the uh, phenotypes. We're not limited to animals. We're happy to look at plants too. Um, if diabetes doesn't get you, then maybe tobacco will, right? <clears throat> so we use a green tobacco leaf as an example here. I uh, wanted to look at some metabolites, and this is just some snapshots. But if you look at this peak, which looks like a nice, well-behaved peak, uh, the devil's in the details. And this is not actually a nice, well-behaved peak, but it's two relatively important metabolites, cholesterol and alpha-tocopherol. Uh, one very good for you, one not very good for you. And by doing comparisons with, with library searches, as I alluded to yesterday, even with the accurate mass and TOF, we're still able to get very robust library matches, 833 for the tocopherol and 880 for cholesterol. And all of that with uh, one part per million mass accuracy. So we're robustly confident that this is in fact cholesterol as opposed to some other sterile because with this preponderance of information, there is opportunity for misidentification. GC by GC, we're going to stick with rats because we like them. And we're going to stick with Karen's theme of liver for a minute. Actually, I think that's the exact same picture uh, that, that you used. Promise coincidence. Um, here we're looking at ethanol exposure, though. And uh, what happens when mice drink wine, which they don't do very often, but you know, everybody's allowed to binge every once in a while, right? So we'll look at fatty liver disease. We did use a different approach that I alluded to last night where we looked at pooled control and pooled treated animals, uh, took them through the process, freeze, pulverize, extract, pool by condition then, derivatize, and then GC by GC TOF MS. The idea being that we're going to identify the principal changers, and then we can go back and look at those by TOF or other mechanisms later. And what do we see? Uh, we see some robust changes. Um, here, a fatty acid, octadecanoate, not surprising, it's liver after all, and it's actually a relatively well-known phenomenon. But nice clean peak, um, pretty colors, all that, so it's very visually appealing, but it's also well resolved in time and space. As you can see here, a, a normal control can be used as a reference, right? you were calling this um, a reference and everything will be compared to it. So here the diseased pooled animal is compared to it and we ran replicates of each of these. Um, and this will tell you cleanly and quickly what's differentially expressed. It's either present or absent here, up or down regulated to within a threshold, 10%, 15%, And it's indicated as, as out of tolerance or not within specifications. So what do we see? Here's some more additional examples. Uh, proline, not too much difference. Um, an, a dipeptide here, which was actually authenticated, uh, very robustly differentiated. Linoleic acid, small differentiation, and tryptophan in this particular case, substantial difference. Uh, and we had more than 50 analytes up or down regulated that were identified by this reference protocol. The, the other thing, as I said, this leads to is, this is a great discovery tool. Okay, a lot of space, a lot of ability to identify analytes, and what we did, and I won't share here, is we went on and looked at it by 1D TOF. This is also an opportunity to take a discovery tool and translate it to a GC triple quad for robust larger studies for more quantitative, higher precision analysis. Oh, forgot to recognize uh, this study was, was supported by Dr. Zhang Zhang at uh, Louisville, a great collaborator, really sharp guy. Wish I was that sharp. Um, final example that I'll use is breath analysis. Okay, it's a interesting trend in analysis. There's a lot of people that are pursuing what's called the volatome. Uh, those volatile analytes or volatile metabolites that are expressed when you exhale. You take what they look for is you take a deep breath, exhale, and when you feel like you can't exhale anymore, keep going. And that's what this tube is all about. It's got a little cartridge in it a thermal desorption cartridge, and they collect two things. 
They use a pump to pull air through to collect ambient, and then you provide your actual breath sample. And then we analyze. Um, 1DGC has been very useful in this already. Okay, it's, it's, it's very successful in lung and breast cancer, heart transplants, and some others, which have shown proof of principle and some uh, biomarkers or putative biomarkers uh, for these diseases. And this is a very typical chromatogram, very, very, very representative, nice, clean peaks. But 2DGC provides you with so much more information. This is the same breath sample, not the same sample, same subject, um, presented in 2D. And as you can see, this would be the 1Z, 1D presentation, looking back. And then you have all of this space that's now filled with analytes and metabolites. And then if you use the two samples that are provided, you do a differential analysis. What did they actually expel? And that's the differential here. Uh, again, it kind of alludes back to Chris Beecher's comment that there's a lot of junk. Well, we can actually subtract some of the junk out if we do the right experiment. <clears throat> so, so what happens? Well, there's some limitations of 1DGC, and, and these are uh, 200 volatiles. That, that's an okay number. Uh, but this is 200 volatiles at a signal to noise of 10. Pretty risky. Uh, coalition or poor matching, there were a lot of analytes that were not identified. Uh, and ID is not consistent because, in part, due to this. If you switch to GC by GC, different story, you now have 2,000 volatiles. Again, it's a risky position because this is a signal to noise of 10. These collaborators at Minsana, they understand their risks. That's okay, it's a choice, right? Some people like to be conservative and go 100 to 1 signal to noise, 10 to 1 signal to noise. It's all what you're willing to deal with, the amount of data and the risk. In GC by GC, the coalition is minimal, and marker ID, identification by database comparison, is very robust and consistent. So to wrap up, um, metabolomic studies with GCGC -GC provides capabilities to define modulated metabolites. Okay? High resolution MS provides the ability to identify unknowns and confidently identify knowns through both accurate mass. I didn't talk specifically about isotopic abundance today. I addressed it a little bit yesterday. Chemical ionization enables molecular ion identification and clearer identification of your unknowns and confirmation of metabolites. And it provides a linear sensitivity needed for metabolomic analysis. Deconvolution is a highly enabling tool. It lets you see metabolites that may be colluding or that may be partially colluding and confidently detect them and identify them in a quantitative fashion. And then finally, GC by GC TOF provides the separation space to see additional analytes and metabolites and to do it in a sensitive and robust fashion. And if you put this together with a software package like Gene Data that does a lot of the alignment, quantitative and statistical processing, it's a very powerful tool, we think, that can be applied to a lot of problems. Got to acknowledge the people who did the work all this wonderful group, our global applications team, uh, and then Gene Data and SciEx for their collaborative efforts, as well as Dr. Zhang and Minsana. And I thank you all for your attention.